So welcome. Today we're going to talk to you about what we learned whilst migrating our infrastructure from a static infrastructure to Kubernetes whilst maintaining continuous delivery. My name is Odun Fökalstram. I'm the lead developer of infrastructure at fin.no. My name is Hello. My name is um, Eivind Øregård. I'm a developer on the infrastructure team at Finn. So, since we're talking about migrating, just to give you some context to start with, we're going to uh, first talk about uh, some history of infrastructure at Finn, and then we'll get into how we use Kubernetes. After that, we'll talk about uh, the platform that we built on top of Kubernetes, which we've called Finn Infrastructure as a Service. We'll talk about what it is, the motivation for building it in the first place, and how it works. Then we'll get into some experiences uh, that we've had while migrating applications to this new infrastructure. And we'll try to make some conclusions and leave some room for questions in the end. So what is Finn anyway? Um, Finn is a Norwegian internet marketplace where you can buy and sell cars, real estate, bits and pieces, and you can get uh, hotels and airplane tickets and find a job. It's uh, Norway's second largest website in terms of traffic after VG, which is the biggest national newspaper. Now, Norway is relatively small population-wise. Uh, actually, it's around the size of the Greater Berlin metro area. I looked that up <laughs> on the internet earlier today. Anyway, you can say that we're a, a big fish in a, in a fairly small pond. Finn is owned by uh, Shipstead Media Group, uh, which is a co big company that owns um, among other things, uh, similar sites to Finn in, in uh, several other countries in the world. So here are some vital numbers. At Finn we are about 120 developers, and these developers manage around 350 microservices, along with a handful of uh, bigger applications. And these developers ship to production around a thousand times a week on average. And the median time uh, from a developer pushing a change to an application to that change being rolled out into production is, is uh, six minutes. And it's very important to us that our developers can deliver value quickly. So we have dashboards and KPI built around these numbers. So basically, we managed to get this development speed before we started using Kubernetes. So I'm just going to talk a little bit about how our infrastructure evolved and what we did before, uh, what we did to achieve this speed and then try to s talk about some of the problems we had and why we had to move. This is data from our development pipeline, which is our home build system. The journey to continuous delivery and microservices at Finn started in 2007. But on the delivery part, you could really only start to see signs of that if you do deployments by week in 2013 when we started to grow. And then in the next few years, we had a real big growth. So I think we, we have, we now deploy to production over 1,000 times a week regularly, and we can go, go up to 1,200 or 1,400. And we did this. We had, we had a bunch of steps we went through. First, Finn was a monolithic architecture, and we had we basically deployed it manually uh, from operators, and we wanted to we wanted to change that. So the management had went, gone to a conference and heard uh, Mary Popendick speak, and they wanted to achieve some of the development uh, speed she talks about. So they came back and said instead of releasing every f third month, we're going to release every month. And then on the technology side, people started. We started creating. Uh, creating some shared good Java libraries to make it easier to create services. And we created different servers. We had an API server, a module server for all our web services. And we had some uh, pu puppet project that controlled development. Basically, what we did was we restricted the options for the developers. So a Java app at Finn looked in a specific way, and that was the only way to do it, which made it easy to create new apps and create new services. And when we had more services, we started to get development speed. But then when we had 150, 200 different services running on uh, the same actual bare metal servers, we started getting problems because one application started um, creating problems for another application. And we learned that 
For developers, if they know the guy who takes down their app in production, it's okay. But if the guy sits on a different floor, for instance, and you don't say hello to him on a daily basis, you get angry. And you don't talk to that guy, you talk to the infrastructure department anyway. Uh, so we, we try to solve that by using, um, or to start using OpenStack. We created virtual machines for the separate applications. So then instead of having 200 applications running on one server, we had 200, 300 virtual machines running, which was not easy to operate. We, there was a lot of stuff uh, operator that Finn needed to know to be able to fix problems in production. Uh, we had to know what, where all the different um, applications ran on which server, and he had to know about all the virtual machines we created. So even though we had a lot of speed, we saw that the complexity grew and the work it took to operate this increased. But of course, we want to be cool developers and read the internet. And we went on Hacker News. And a couple of years back, there was one simple answer on Hacker News on what to do if you had to solve something with programming. Docker. And we started using Docker. We, we had Docker, and Docker is great, I think, for developers. It's easy to run something on the same way on your local host as in production. But as soon as we started getting any kind of traction on running Docker in production, we saw that it gives you a new set of problems. Because when you run Docker in production, there are so many other things you need to do to be able to get the actual value out of Docker. Because when there's no longer any binding between the application and the underlying infrastructure, you can, you can start running the containers wherever you want to. And then you need some kind of system that handles that for you because you can't do that manually. And as soon as the containers start moving around, you need to have some kind of service discovery to figure out where the containers are at all points. And of course, you don't want to, as uh, uh, someone said earlier, you don't want to be waking up at night just because an uh, a container dies if you can just restart it. So we need to have some kind of lifecycle support and monitoring to help you. And when you get have all these services and all the develop all these developers, you need you want to you want to control who has access to what. So you want some kind of authorization and authentication mechanism, and you want to control that. And lastly, we saw that when we started using Docker, we we crammed a lot of stuff into our containers. We started putting all the infrastructure and all the business applications into one container, and that made it really hard to upgrade one thing. For instance, we had to build a new container. So we wanted some way of aggregating our containers into jobs without building it into one image. And of course, when we have, uh, when we're a web shop in Norway, we have quite a, quite a small window of where our peak traffic is. It's normally between 8 o'clock at night and 11. So we wanted to be able to scale our jobs according to traffic, which we hadn't at all before. So we needed some sort of system to solve all of these problems that we now had. And after some searching and even experimenting with running Mesos for a while, uh, long story short, we landed on using Kubernetes. So we've set up Kubernetes from scratch uh, on our own hardware. And this was before the Kubernetes, the hardware guide existed. Uh, so there was kind of a guy that pointed in a general direction. But since Kubernetes is uh, so flexible, there were a lot of details that we had to figure out for ourselves. Things like what, what Linux are we going to use? What versions of the different components are actually compatible with each other? How do we solve the Kubernetes net network infrastructure requirements? And how do we do configuration and deployment and, and all of that? Um, let's just say that we learned a lot. <laughs> but luckily, the situation has improved a lot uh, since then. It's a while ago now. Anyway, we started out running uh, on virtual machines that we provisioned from our OpenStack cluster that we already had. We used Terraform for this. And then we did the installing and configuration of Kubernetes itself with Puppet, which we already used as well. But after a long period of uh, debugging hypervisor performance issues in OpenStack, uh, we decided to just repurpose a few of those OpenStack nodes to be a pure Kubernetes nodes and run directly on the metal. So right now, we're running production on uh, a few pretty large bare metal nodes that are running in our own data center. And we're in our development environments in the <laughs> Google Container Engine. This is really nice. Uh, it's much easier to set up a cluster. You can just click a button or run a CLI command, and then you have a cluster. 
very nice. But unfortunately, we can't run production on Google Container Engine due to a lot of reasons, one of which is uh, that we are using a, a database that isn't particularly cloud-friendly uh, right now. Yes, and so now we had Kubernetes running, but we still had all our microservices and all our developers. And as we started to learn a bit about how Kubernetes works, we realized we needed to build something on top, basically to replicate the restrictions we created in our Puppet setup to make it easy for people to create applications to run our, on, our, on our infrastructure. But the main reason was that we could create something called Fin Infrastructure as a Service. And if you're Norwegian, you would pronounce that FIAS. And that basically is silliness. In, um, it's, it's <laughs> there's funny because now we, have, we talk about migrating stuff to FIAS and there's management sending emails, but we need more FIAS and everything. It's <laughs> quite good. <laughs> so I really recommend trying to get a silly name for your platform. But as I said, we had, three, we had 130 developers and 350 microservices. We needed, to, we needed to figure out how to run fin applications on Kubernetes. As we'll talk more about, what we basically did was we, we, dis, we created a set of contracts that describe how the applications and the infrastructure should talk to each other. And we said, as long as you adhe adhere to these contracts, you can do whatever you want to. And this reduced the solution space for developers a lot. They don't, have to, they don't know how we do networking. They don't know how we do storage. They just know what FIAS is. Of course, they need access to Kubernetes to be able to debug and do migrations. But it's, it's much easier. So we really wanted our platform to be opinionated. We wanted it to be clear and say exactly how, what a fin application looks like. Right now, we're kind of in the, we migrated as many applications so we can now say this is, it works. Uh, we, as soon as I went up on stage at Finn and said, you can do Docker, there was four developers came running to my play, uh, desk straight after because everybody wants to use Docker. Uh, and then we use, kind of used those poor souls to create our, the first version of our platform because they could take anything. Couldn't, could be as unstable as you want to but they would be happy. And now we're running some of the biggest services. We have introduced auto-scaling, so we scale up and down according to traffic. And now it's basically, now most developers see that this is, this is a better way to go. So they come to us and want to migrate instead of the other way around. And of course we measure distinctly how many services run on, uh, on FIAS. So we, we use it sort of three-layered model to describe it as. Um, at the bottom, we have uh, a Kubernetes cluster, which can be uh, our on-premise cluster or one of our, our Google Container Engine clusters. Let me try to make sure that uh, these clusters have the same cluster add-ons and, and so on, so that the clusters behave in mostly the same way. On top of Kubernetes, we, we run what we call platform services. And these are tools that handle application needs like deployment, logs and metrics aggregation, and traffic ingress, etc. And these are deployed using a continuous delivery pipeline that we built uh, based on Helm. On top of these services, and sort of around these services, we run our business applications. And these can rely on the APIs of our platform services, as well as the Kubernetes API. And these are deployed using the FIAS system, which I'll get to in a second. So I didn't mention contracts, but at the core of FIAS are these well-defined contracts that descri describe the relationship between the infrastructure and the applications that run inside it. These contracts cover what we think are the basic needs of an application, like allocating compute resources, deployment, logging, metrics, as well as how to get traffic into your application. So we try to design these contracts to sort of cover the 80% case, which for us means mostly stateless services that talk to each other over the network, so that developers of these applications can more easily migrate to this new infrastructure regardless of what sort of pr uh, program language or framework they're using for uh, writing that application. And when the way applications interact with the infrastructure is well-defined like this, uh, it's easier to achieve a, a you-build-it-you-run-it culture as well, which you want. 
And this is easier because the running it part of it is just easier. Also, also we, we kind of create, if we implemented some of these contracts as shared libraries for some of our most used programming languages. The login contract, for instance, is just a shared Java library called commons logging, or not commons, something logging. Yeah, but if you want to write an application in Haskell or something, you are sort of on your own, You just, but you have these contracts that you have to adhere to anyway. So you know what you have to do. To implement these contracts, we use a YAML configuration file named Fias YAML for each application. This file lives in the application's source repository and is used by our pipeline and deployment system. Uh, to the right, here you can see the, the Fias YAML config file for the service that renders the header on most pages on our site. It's about nine lines of uh, config. And to the left, you can see the beginning of the Kubernetes manifest YAML. Uh, for this application when it's actually deployed into a cluster, and it's about 147 lines. But the important thing about this isn't necessarily just a fewer lines of config. The interesting part is the abstraction layer that this creates for us. And it buys us a few nice things. It means that we can change the configuration that the developers don't see. This buys us a lot of room to sort of um, change the underlying infrastructure if we have to, without the application developers having to change every application they own. This makes them happy. And when every applica application sort of looks the same, or at least similar, from an operational perspective, this means that we can more easily do changes in the live production system if we have to, and that sometimes happens. Since most applications look the same, it's easier to get better development speed as well, since developers just have less configuration to worry about. So development speed is important. We, we want to push our six minute median time to production even further. So we need a deployment system that's fast and reliable. And this is the way we do it with Kubernetes. We have a deployable that uh, has two parts. We have a FIAS YAML config file and a reference to a Docker image. So when a developer pushes a change to, to his application, these two things are packaged by the CI system and our pipeline, which is a web application that we built ourselves, uh, it triggers a deploy to the development environment automatically. The way it does this is, is just by publishing a message on a Kafka topic. And then we have a kind of operator that runs inside the cluster. We've named it uh, Fias Deploy Daemon. So, suitably boring name. <laughs> it's, anyway, it subscribes on this topic and um, uh, it when it receives a message, it talks to the Kubernetes API server and uh, creates these re the required Kubernetes resources based on the FIAS YAML file. And when it's done and all of the pods are running and healthy, it pushes a mes message back to the pipeline so that uh, it can render a nice green box in the web front end so that our developer knows that everything is fine in production. At this point, there are some teams that run some integration tests, or some teams maybe have a manual verification step in the pipeline uh, before the change is rolled out into production. Yes. And of course, at Finn, as most people should, we focus a lot on observability. We had, uh, bef even before we moved to Kubernetes, we've been collecting metrics and aggregating logs for a long time. Uh, for logging, we used to run uh, the Elk stack on our legacy systems, but when we moved to Kubernetes, we replaced the uh, Logstash with Fluentd just because it's easier and then we can use, it's just easier to run. Uh, and the logging part basically just works. We have some developers that still want to go to the disk on the, where the application run to do grep and tail. Uh, so we have kind of a constructive conversation with them to try to uh, teach them that even though that's how we used to do it, it doesn't really work that, that way anymore. And we might be able to put some logs on an S3 bucket or something so they can go do their thing. And for metrics, we use Prometheus. And if you went uh, listen to the keynotes earlier, he described the uh, integration between Prometheus and Kubernetes. When I saw that the first time, approximately a year ago, I saw that it was incredib incredibly powerful. You get so much for free because you have you know, functionality in Prometheus that 
understands the Prometheus, no, functionality in Prometheus, it understands the Kubernetes APIs, and use that for service discovery. So we, we just basically just uh, deploy Prometheus into our cluster and give it a more or less standard configuration file. And that discovers everything that runs in the cluster. And a part of the contract uh, for Fin application is that you should instrument your application with the Prometheus client and at least expose the um, default metrics, which is CPU, memory, and those kinds of things. And then because we have the metadata from uh, Prometheus and we put some uh, additional metadata using uh, Fiast deploy daemon, that flows through the system. We have that metadata in Prometheus and we can use that in Grafana. So what you see on the screen here is basically a default dashboard that any application that deploys to our clusters get for free. It's just because the, we just use the app label uh, in Prometheus and Kubernetes as a, to populate a dropdown. So each new app just gets a new line in the dropdown and you just go to the da this dashboard and you find the app. And of course, then we can also do things across every, every application because every, all applications uh, send out CPU data the same way, for instance. So we could easily, even though we don't, don't it, we could say what team uses most resources. We have all the data in Prometheus. We just need to create the query and get someone who needs the data. The last thing we built is something called the FIAS Canary app. This is one application that we deploy using as part of the platform applications that tests all the functionality. It tries to expose the metrics and see that this comes into Prometheus. It tries to talk to another application in the cluster and it uh, I'll put some logs and look at, look at that in Kibana. And this we use as part of the cluster uh, deployment pipeline. So we, we deploy uh, all our platform applications into a staging cluster and then we do a call to the um, Canary app to see that everything works. And if that works, we upgrade the production cluster. So we even have kind of continuous delivery on our platform applications into production. So now to the last part, which turns out to be one of the most time consuming and difficult parts. Migrating applications to Docker and Kubernetes and ma basically make them cloud native. And of course the easy way of doing that is just saying you need to be 12 factor. And f at least for new applications, that's quite easy. They can, most developers will do that just by reading the doc and it's quite easy. But we have loads of legacy, we spent 10 years trying to write, write applications and most of them doesn't really fit. We have someone that needs disk and we have someone that's tied to some tiny minute detail in our, in our puppet setup that's impossible to replicate in Kubernetes. So for some applications, migrating to Fias is like an hour of work and for some it's weeks. The funny thing is, even the people who spent weeks migrating applications to Docker and Kubernetes tells us that they think their application has gotten better uh, <laughs> from that work. It's less coupled to the infrastructure and it's easier to scale up and down, for instance. Yeah. So adapting applications is just the first part of the journey for migrating, though. Uh, these applications are obviously connected and migrating an entire dis uh, complex distributed system uh, like this is di difficult. So we needed to build sort of some mechanisms uh, to make it easier and safer to do at speed to avoid accidents. But before we can get to that, um, or to give you some context for what we've done for migrating, we first have to talk about how we do traffic ingress. Um, and to run traffic, uh, from the internet into our cluster. Uh, we use an ingress controller that we've implemented ourselves. It's based on HAProxy. And we run uh, two HAProxy instances in an active passive topo topology, and they live outside the cluster itself. And we use uh, node port services for, uh, for each application that we deploy in the cluster to make HAProxy be able to talk to this. And this ingress controller integrates with our feature toggling tool, uh, which is called Unleash. And note that this is a logical diagram. The traffic doesn't actually run through the Unleash uh, component. It's just used to configure the ingress controller. Also, when you deploy an application into the cluster using FIAS, you can send uh, requests to uh, your, that's supposed to go to your application to 
your app name dot some well-defined FQDN that's set up as, as a wildcard DNS entry. And uh, then the traffic will be routed into your application via the ingress controller without the developers essentially having to do anything. But you can also override this uh, in the FIAS YAML config file by specifying a different domain name and path for where the application should be available. So basically what we do is rely heavily on using feature toggling in the load balancer. Um, and the way it works is that uh, application developers can create feature toggles in the Unleash application, which is a web application. And as long as these follow a specific naming scheme, they'll be picked up by the ingress controller and the ingress controller will, will be configured to route traffic uh, in a way that you could, you could uh, use the feature toggle to say that I want 10% of traffic to go into Kubernetes. <clears throat> and then the rest of the remaining 90% will continue to go into the legacy infrastructure for, for any given application. And we can do these toggles in the load balancer or sometimes we do it in the client library if there's a service that's only used internally. And, and that's cool, but migrating only parts of the traffic is just one part of the puzzle for doing it safely. Because we also need to learn what's going on. So we need to look at some metrics. So we basically what we have is a dashboards that are measuring the same thing in the new infrastructure and the old <coughs> infrastructure. And these are things like uh, response time and status per call, or research usage uh, like CPU memory, uh, threads in use, uh, file, descriptor, file descriptors that are consumed by the application, and so on. And we also have our application developers be heavily involved in this process as well, because they usually, usually know their applications best, and they know how they work and what we should measure. I think this graph is probably from a time where it wasn't going that well. <laughs> I hope so, at least. So we measure how things are going on in the, both of the infrastructures and compare to see if everything looks good. And if it does, we can just push more traffic until we hit some limit and the graph ends up looking like this. And we have to kind of roll back and start troubleshooting what was going on. And it, This isn't easy. You kind of have to handle each case separately, but I guess this is the most, the, the most general thing that we've found that has worked for us. To, to sort of maintain the development speed that we want while migrating uh, to a new infrastructure, infrastructure. So for conclusions, uh, Kubernetes isn't necessarily for everybody. If we tried moving our monolithic application onto Kubernetes, we'd just, everything would just gone a bit slower, basically. It wouldn't give, an, give us any value, but we need uh, we need, uh, you need microservices and you need small components to properly get the value out of Kubernetes. And if you're as big as Finn is, which in Norwegian terms at least is big, it's probably worth it to create something on top of Kubernetes uh, to restrict the, the choices of developers. Also, this is an important way of achieving the continuous delivery and the development speed you need. If every developer who wanted to create a new service at Finn sat down and thought about how they, which ingress controller they would choose, we wouldn't be able to do anything. We would just discuss te technology, which of course is cool, but it doesn't, for some reason, product people don't like that. Uh, and metrics, metrics is the most important thing. If you want to migrate in a safe way, you need to know what happens in production. And it, took, it didn't take us too long to create kind of a minimum viable product thing uh, that we could start to use for migration. But actually migrating takes a lot of time. And we, I think we, the sooner you can start migrating, the sooner you can get actual feedback on what features you need to create, which is useful. If you want to be a part of this, Shipset, which is the owner of Finn, uh, has openings. So go to jobs.chipset.com. And then it's time for questions. Migrate the app and we will 
environment with that, or do you think about that approach as well, or is it? Well, I think I can imagine the developers coming to me complaining that I had to rewrite everything. Yes. <laughs> or, actually, I can imagine the product people deciding what the developers should do, coming to complain to me that developers can't create products, they can only create their applications again. So we wanted to, we wanted to reduce the things you need to do as much as possible. Right now, if you create a Docker container and you create a Fialz YAML, the pipeline will just deploy your application into both systems. So we then we wanted to reduce the things to do to a minimum to migrate. Um, yes? How did you do this all logistically? Um, in the sense of you have a new infrastructure, you move to Kubernetes, do you just hire more people or is it the same people who support both in infrastructures? Um, how did you manage this? Because we can't just double, let's say, the ops team, but we would like to move to something like this. So were you able to do it basically in parallel, or did you have to hire a specific amount of people that only does this job? Well, before we started this process, Finn kind of had made one strategic decision. They wanted to have you build it, you run it. So of these 120 developers, they basically killed the operations department and created the infrastructure department, which was both the ops guys and a bunch of developers. So then we created a bigger infrastructure department than what we had as an operations team. And that gave us some extra, some extra strength and made it possible to do more. But at the same time, we said that this department shouldn't do ops. They should create tools so that the developers do their own operations. And then we got even more leeway. So basically, we moved all the responsibility to the developers, and then we started creating tooling that made it easy for them to do it. And this really works. We see that not every developer, but enough developers have this connection to their production environment, and they get alerts and everything. So we, I think we managed to achieve this ability to run it in a proper way, and that makes everything easier. Because then they also understand why this is better. No, well, the devs also work on the old infrastructure, but they probably need more help, and it's not as easy. More questions? Yes? What, what are typical problems um, which occur when you are migrating from the old infrastructure to uh, Kubernetes? Uh, there isn't really a typical problem. There's different problems every time. <laughs> I can remember one where the applications kind of had, they had to pre-warm their caches before they could start accepting traffic. And this pre-warming was created somewhere deep in Puppet. So there was this extra call from Puppet to the application after it started by hitting an HTTP endpoint. And that's not possible to do in Kubernetes. So they had to kind of rewrite their application to do that themselves. And then that didn't really fit how the application was structured. And then it, that took a week or two, which basically is the worst case we had. You also end up finding a lot of application bugs. Uh, so <laughs> yeah. we, had, we had one, just because the infrastructure is different. A lot of it is because the network is different. Um, one example is uh, we had an application that uh, didn't set a timeout on its uh, database connection pools. And uh, for some reason, the network uh, started not remembering netted connections. So it uh, ended up just having uh, all of its connections waiting for a response forever. And then it died. So that's just strange things that you discover when the infrastructure changes. We also had problems with DNS being slower and Node.js not caching DNS responses. So every request was slower. So a lot of strange things are happening. But you just have to take everything as it comes and try to solve it. And again, I think everybody agrees that the quality increases when you do this. So in theory, at least, everybody is happy. In practice, it doesn't. Yeah, we've even had a few developers. <laughs> yeah, we've even had a few developers saying that my application is so much better now after I migrated, which is, sounds good. Then we give them cake. Yeah. <laughs> yes? Uh, well, the Fias deployed him, which is a Python script running inside the cluster. That creates the ingress for the service if you need it to be exposed externally. Can I define the service or is it implicit 
Uh, no, you can't define this. This is done in Python code. Oh. So that's one of the things we take away from the developers. Yeah? Uh, I wonder how you um, get, the, the, get the knowledge of Kubernetes, the primitives, and so So how did you train, or how, how did the people get the, their knowledge? It's just like it happens by viral, uh, I tell you, you tell me what you experience, or do you have a plan on uh, how Kubernetes works? Like the theory and the practice and getting hands on, and mm. so to, to, to do, do it right. When we started, we only knew Mesos. <laughs> yeah, but and then we kind of the people who, well, when we before the hard way guide, you learn a lot just by installing it. Of course, <laughs> even when the hard way guide is there, you learn a lot. And then basically we talk to developers, and because because we have this ability running culture, it's the developers will they will they will just have to learn because they are responsible for their own production system. And when we change the production system, they have to learn, and that's... Okay, so a little bit forced. Yeah, well, I've, I think I've talked to every developer at Finn four times in the last <laughs> year, just saying Kubernetes. Just a quick one, you mentioned Helm at one point, which is the operator, the doing that. That's also deployed using Helm. The, the operator is not using Helm itself, but we're using Helm as part of our continuous delivery pipeline to sort of install all of the platform services. So the actual app, the business applications are not uh, Helm or uh, No. No. Ah, so That's just what, just, just a, yeah, just a Fias YAML and a Docker file. That's all you need to do. And then the, we do the, we, the Fias deploy them and does all the calls to the uh, API, Kubernetes APIs. Yes? Can you elaborate a little bit more on why you became essentially your own cloud provider? Was it a business decision or was it a technical decision? Uh, a bit of both, I think. We wanted to, when we started to do the Ubility Run It, the developers, they didn't have the knowledge that some of the operator, operators had before. For instance, we have apps running on some of the module, mod servers. and. The user service runs on mod one, two, three, but not four because that crashes at some point, but five. And if you want to restart that service, you need to know this. And when you, when you give this responsibility to everybody, it, it just doesn't scale. Everybody needs to know too much. And we needed to, we needed to change this tool because the complexity of all the microservices kind of came back to us. It was the small, the shoes on the big foot. We grew out our infrastructure uh, as it was. So we needed to create new tooling. And that was the main reason. I don't know if you would call that technical or manager, but we kind of collectively agreed that we need to do something here. And of course, we want to use stock. <laughs> or we did. So my, my question would then be, why not go with the cloud provider? Like, should try to with the internet? Oh, no. Uh, the, the database we talked about can't be moved from the data center right now. It runs on Solaris and stuff. <laughs> <laughs> and we can't. We can't have the services in Belgium or Frankfurt with the database in Oslo. Uh, yeah. But I tried, believe me. <laughs> yeah, thank you for coming. Thank you very much. <laughs>